to this uh, interview. And um, you can see that Bobby has uh, as, as notified us all that we're being recorded. If you'll click that button. Um, so as many of you know, this, uh, this series of interviews that Linda and I do once a month is sponsored by the Academy of Professional Dialogue. And um, I really want to encourage you uh, to look at what uh, Bobby's going to put in the chat about the Academy. Uh, I don't usually talk very much about it, but right now is an important time. Um, you may know that there are Academy members from all over the world that, um, th uh, that are members of the Academy and that we join together in trying to really spread dialogue uh, across the world. Uh, we don't have so we have a few people from other countries on the phone, but because of the time dis difference, it's a little difficult. But we definitely are an international group, so it's really wonderful. Um, also, the upcoming um, academy. Oops, sorry, I have to do that. Uh, the upcoming academy uh, conference is going to be the 26th of October, so it's just like a week and a half away uh, through the 30th uh, and five days. It's it's going to be fantastic. We have some really, really interesting papers. We have a, a day on the middle day in which we're doing brief encounters, which are small 35-minute uh, interactive sessions. So it's, it's really going to be exciting. And um, uh, Bobby will probably put in there in the chat as well something about the Academy. So look at that and see if that's of interest to join us on the 26th. Um, so Bobby, if you will take our picture, then we can, uh, then I'll turn it over to Linda to uh, do the introduction. Okay, perfect. So I'm just going to get everybody to smile. So three, two, one. Thank you. Great. All right. So uh, may I also ask everyone if you will turn off your video and if you will mute yourselves so that just on screen will appear um, Linda and I and Lauren and then um, and then we will bring you back again when we get when we're ready to go into the uh, uh, into breakout groups. <clears throat> So Linda, over right. to you. Yeah, thanks Nancy for getting us started. So Lauren, it's um, been a, a while since this uh, since I first met you and <laughs> we're doing this now. Uh, Lauren and I met a few years back. Lauren is a PhD philosopher, univers university professor at Endicott College, researcher and author of several books, including Overcoming Polarization in the Public Square, civic dialogue, which we will mainly be drawing on today. She has worked with a number of dialogic processes, including reflective structured dialogue, and that really comes from essential partners who used to be called the Public Conversation Project for those who've been around the dialogue field for long enough, um, and intergroup dialogue from Michigan State. At Heathmere, where she is a program developer, she engages marginalized youth in dialogue and the arts. She has studied how implicit bias negatively impacts our ability to engage civilly with each other across party lines and how by placing dialogue before deliberation, it is possible to build the necessary relational bonds and shared understandings that can lead to more effective political conversations. Well, I was thinking today that, especially after last night's town hall and debate, I couldn't even, the two presidential candidates couldn't even come into agreement enough to have an in-person debate together that we have uh, come a long way to, towards polarization and away from dialogue. So this could not be a timely uh, interview with you at this point. So can you give us a little bit of your background, Lauren, in terms of how you came to write this particular book? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks. Great to be here um, and happy to be part of the series. I've, I've learned a lot from uh, previous uh, interviews, so hopefully some of you can learn a little bit today. Um, so I um, am a philosopher by training, as Linda mentioned, and um, one philosopher that I've spent a lot of time on, sometimes I think too much, is the German philosopher Hans Georg Gadamer, who was a 20th century philosopher whose emphasis uh, in philosophy is a field called hermeneutics. 
Hermeneutics is a fancy word for the art of interpretation. But Gadamer drew on uh, Buber's, Martin Buber's dialogic, I and thou, to describe and capture what goes on in interpretation and understanding. So for Gadamer, this I, thou, and dialogue was always very central, although it wasn't really a commented part um, in terms of his work, but I was in, I've been interested in that for a while. And um, I think basically from Gadamer's work, I started thinking about, is there anything that he says that could be applicable to uh, the practice of dialogue? And so I should also say then, um, I have had uh, facilitation training with several organizations, Essential Partners, as you mentioned, also the Intergroup Dialogue out at University of Michigan, uh, which really focuses on issues of justice and equity in terms of dialogue. And, um, and then, uh, yeah, more recently doing um, dialogue work through this um, nonprofit that I helped co-found. So I think there's, I think it was, a, to answer your question, there was this theoretical interest, but then also this practical interest that came together. And for me as a philosopher, again, the, the tradition, the dominant tradition in political philosophy has been focused on the deliberation, deliberation, deliberative democracy as the primary form of civic or political discourse. And while there has been a lot of nuance in the development and change of deliberative democracy over the, over the decades now, some studies have showed that, um, and I'm thinking here of Diana Moot's book, um, that people can really be quite reticent to talk to the other, especially in polarized situations. And so this book was an investigation into some um, alternatives to deliberation, namely dialogue, to see if these approaches might be better suited for um, particularly heightened and um, polarized civic squares. And I, I do have a follow-on question before I hand it back to Nancy. I guess I'm kind of, I'm, I'm fascinated that our whole political system seems to be way more rooted in the deliberative, the de debate style, that which comes from, as you say, reasoned, rational judgment, which always gets in the way until you establish that, that other level of shared meaning, which of course comes from dialogue. Do you have a sense from just I, maybe a historical philosophical uh, uh, knowledge of why our political system uh, went that direction? <laughs> yeah, I would definitely blame the um, although maybe not Plato and, and who I start with in my book talking a little bit about, but certainly there became, there was a, a time in the history of Western thought where rational argumentation became everything. And the belief in the power of individual cognition, right? Maybe we could say starting with Descartes, he's easy to blame, um, everyone's favorite whipping boy. Um, but seriously though, I think the belief that thinking resides in our minds, that as an individual, I'm fully in control of it, yeah. that the ideal is to think rationally and the belief that if somebody differs from me, my arguments will have some efficacy. They can actually do something. People will listen to me and we can come together. I mean, this is somewhat of the ideal of John Stuart Mill in coming together in um, the public square, the marketplace of ideas where we can exchange ideas and the true ones will arise to the top. Um, so I think that sounds like a really great theory and ideal, but <laughs> alas, it hasn't really seemed to work in the public square practically. And we not only observe that, I mean, you and I and everybody not only can observe this just on a daily basis, but what's interesting, and also part of my book, is how a fair amount of um, neurocognition now is showing that rationality is not what, the rational argumentation is not as powerful as the philosophers thought it was. I mean, they don't call out philosophers, I'm calling out philosophers. So um, there's been a lot of work on Jonathan Haidt, Daniel Kahneman particularly has popped 
popularize this show, I think what men must experience on a day-to-day -day basis that if you want to change someone's mind, rational argumentation is rarely the most effective way to go about that. And so again, in this book, I'm trying to present an alternative way of um, engaging in discourse because we don't want the alternative, um, which one of the pragmatists that I mentioned earlier, Richard Rorty, has sort of notoriously said, you know, at the end of the day, because you and I differ so fundamentally, we're going to have to reach for our guns. So I think if we don't want to, you know, give up on interacting all together and just to resort to force, what was really motivating me is what sort of discourse is possible. And then also drawing on some contemporary empirical research, what is actually been shown to be uh, positive ways for people to interact. Thank you. Um, so it's clear that Buber's had a strong influence on your thinking, and particularly the I thou idea of, of his. And would you just talk about how you think about I thou, what that means to you in terms of what a, what a dialogue looks like in which I thou is, a, is occurring? Could you just help us think about that concept a little bit? Yeah, sure. And I, I start my book, um, well, actually in the second chapter, by specifically looking at Boover and going into his thinking in more depth, um, because I believe that what his work shows is why dialogue is effective. So this is the question you're getting at, Nancy, is what does he mean by I thou? And for um, Boover, he talks about how um, human, human beings emerge already connected with a thou. So we do not, we are not sort of, we don't come into existence as completely independent entities. Again, we can see this on a, on a physiological, but also emotional um, levels, right, that we, that we know. Um, and so we are rooted in togetherness and connection. This is our fundamental way of being in the world. And at some point we can I argue that we can, uh, the Buber shows that we can take a further step, right? We have this uh, connectivity, but then there's also, of course, distances needed. You can't stay fused with, with people and, and still be an individual. So there is some distantiation, some distance created, and then it's up to us to approach the other in order to renew that connection. And for Buber, the fundamental way that we approach the other is as a full, um, as a full human being. So we don't want to um, patronize the other. We don't want to uh, pretend that we know everything about them, objectify And I think what Buddha really gives us is a way of understanding what it means to fully encounter the other as a human being. Yeah, I, the, I, the parts that I read about that, and you mentioned it, that his saying that at the beginning, I mean, we're connected to our mothers, you know, in, in a very, and in, in, in undifferentiated from our mothers uh, mm -hmm. for a period, I don't know how long, but for a period of months, I assume, and then finally we are differentiated. Mm -hmm. But I like, I like what you said about the fact that, that then, that we have to differentiate, but then we then again have to more deliberately uh, connect. And that's where we, we do run into problems, I think, and where the I-thou, that idea of the I-thou seems to become more important. And, and can you just carry it a little farther and say specifically in terms of how would an I-thou conversation look differently than an I-it conversation look Yeah, yeah. So yeah, just to follow up to a little bit on the first um, question is that, so in other words, I think we can take away from Buber the fact that we are wired to connect. I mean, this is actually what contemporary uh, neuroscience is showing anyway, but so in, Buber obviously didn't use those terms, that terminology, but we are fundamentally beings that seek connection. And so this is what discourse should be about. And so how do we go about this? So in the, in the book, I primarily focus on reflective structure dialogue, but also bring in other, um, other approaches and, and uh, sort of develop it a little ways. But um, in terms of treating, be, uh, being careful not to treat the other like an it, 
one fundamental attitude is really curiosity, right? Approaching the other with curiosity, willing to know uh, who they are, with setting aside your presumptions. This also entails listening, listening not just to the other, but also to oneself. And so again, unlike this, uh, the debate style or sometimes deliberation or other types of political argumentation, where we go into the context thinking, I know everything and I'm gonna try to show you that you don't know as much as me and I'm gonna try to help you think like me. <laughs> um, so that's obviously would be treating you like an it, right? Um, and so, for Buber's understanding of the I-thou and how that translates into practical dialogue is really respecting the other person's um, humanity and a difference. That of course means difference. And I, I want, do wanna highlight that when we connect with others, as you mentioned, that um, the goal is not fusion, but to maintain some sort of differentiation. Um, and that requires, on a practical level in dialogue, really listening to the other's difference. And so how does this, what does this, again, look like in terms of a practical dialogue? Uh, civic dialogue privileges the telling of first-person stories and of narrative. Um, and so, again, rather than coming in with facts and trying to persuade the other, the focus is on asking people to talk about their individual particular differences, to share their own particular stories. So that's a way that allows uh, the difference of humans to emerge, but in a uh, less confrontational way. And so I think it's through um, listening, curiosity, telling stories is a way to validate uh, the other's humanity and without, without losing yours. Right, because it's not that I would walk into a situation and say, "You know everything; I know nothing." Um, so, a, a dialogue is a true engagement between uh, two human beings, an I and a thou. You know that really follows on to this next area I wanted to explore. It's interesting in David Bohm's day that he always gave that story um, of Einstein and Niels Bohr attracting different followers, and neither of their followers could talk to each other because they were so certain that they had the right answer. Yeah. So that, you know, when they came together at a party, they'd stand in different groupings and mm -hmm. how sad that is. And yet how, how human, because if we're coming, especially in a scientific community where rational judgment and reasoning mm -hmm. seems to be what they do. So you can see why David Bohm was quite aware of that. And the other thought thing that I thought was fascinating from your work was when you uh, talk about how that then simplifies the other. In other words, if I have a certain idea of what the other thinks from their reasoning and their rationalization, I probably am not curious about shades of gray at all. I'm just kind of projecting what I think they think, right? Because I know what I think and I think they're wrong. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that creates more distortion. Can you say a little bit more about that? Like how that, that reasoning really leaves no room for that that, uh, that um, ability to kind of look in between the lines or look in between the polarizations. Right, right. Um, that reasoning really does um, eliminate any gray or um, mar margins, you know, in between, in between spaces. Um, and I do think that um, Bohm's example, or I mean, his telling of this actual story of this contention between these scientists is, is um, is, is so important and I think really exemplifies the problem um, that we see today. So um, you were, I'm sorry, can you just repeat your question because I had some noise outside and I was distracted a bit and putting in my headphones. But the second, the second part well, of your comment. I was fascinated that not only does it make it hard to talk to each other, but it actually, if they do talk, they simplify each other's Oh, position. right, right, okay, yeah, yeah. So again, um, asking about the stories of the other, is a really good way to um, uh, show the complexity of the individual. That's what dialogue is about. Um, so when we talk about connecting, dialogue is connecting the other. It's not about reducing everybody to one or simplifying into some, um, uh, some type of unity where there's no difference at all. 
Um, and so when we, when we uh, ask about the particular stories, that's a really, really important way to get over what I think what you were referencing before is stereotyping or describing it in different terms, but stereotyping and generalizing about the other. So that's like one of our favorite um, go-to <laughs> right? We all have our favorite stereotypes of the other. And um, I think what, what Bohm, what was really helpful about uh, Bohm here is that he, he didn't use this type, this terminology, but he was aware of how um, we, we cling to beliefs that are oftentimes uh, we're unaware of. And uh, this, again, today we would call that implicit bias or other forms of cognitive bias. And so I like to think about the dialogue processes, you know, our, our thinking, you know, as, as human beings at, at our base level, at our foundational level, we have values and social identities, values and identities. This is what really is so important for us and touches us at the gut level, at the visceral level, and which makes us very reactive when people, people challenge it. Above that, on the surface, are our um, rational beliefs, our, our, our cognitions. And so again, if you think about um, standard political debate or some forms of, of deliberation, it's aiming at the top. But as long as those beliefs are connected to my heartfelt identities and values, then we're not going to go anywhere. Now, what dialogue helps with, if you think of those values and the social identities, is kept together by the glue of stories. Mm -hmm. So all of our identities and our values we tell some sort of story about, or we're in communities that tell stories about it, right? That's really the glue. And so I think when you bring in a dialogue that helps people tell their stories, um, there are very complex stories um, of individuals. We hear, uh, for example, in the case of um, my own community, I have a friend who's a black woman. She's been very active in the Black Lives Matter, really pushing the mayor and the police chief for change. And yet her daughter is married to a white police officer. So she talks about how she has learned, you know, and she has a good relationship with him and his white family who also contains other white police officers. So when we hear stories like that, it would be easy for, you know, before we hear stories like that, it would be really easy to say, oh, that's just a typical angry black woman who's pushing la la la. She doesn't under, and, and understand anything about the experience of um, police officers, but that's not the case, right? And we're all complex that way. And so stories are a way to bring out the complexity, the, the gray areas, um, and again, expose sort of the deeper underlying uh, fundamental values that connect us all. Right, and, and they don't have to agree. In other words, no. telling your story, you don't have to exactly. agree. Exactly, exactly, right. So the focus in dialogue is really on connecting with the person and not the position. So we don't, um, Dialogue does not aim to have agreement or consensus. Of course, eventually that will occur in the political process, but that's where we can bring in deliberation once we've laid the foundation of dialogue, where we're able to listen to the other a little bit better, uh, where we've created communities of, of trust for the most part, then you know, the, the hard work of policy will be made. But um, really dialogue is about connecting to the other person as a human being, because until we, until we can do that, we're not going to have a, a democracy. <laughs> yeah, I wish we could tell that to our politicians right now. <laughs> life so much easier, <laughs> Nancy. Yeah, um, and I think two things I'd like to follow up on that, uh, and they're, I guess, a, a little bit related. <laughs> you say that your purpose for writing the book, and I'm taking this a sentence from you, but the purpose of writing the book is that you want to deepen the sense in which democratic habituation is cultivated by the practice of dialogue. Mm -hmm. Could you talk more about the, the relationship between dialogue, as you understand it, and democracy? Because it, it, that seems like at the heart of what you're trying to, the, this idea that it's critical to democracy. Right, right. Yeah. So here I'll um, just maybe summon the words of one of my other heroes, uh, John Dewey who has an excellent, um, very short essay called Creative Democracy. You can check it out online. And I do draw on that in the book. Uh, Dewey talks about there being three articles of faith uh, in terms of democracy. And in the book, I interpret those as 
really articulations of what dialogue looks like. And the first one that Dewey mentions is the belief in common humanity. So this is our first article of faith, right? If you're going to sign up to the Church of Democracy, <laughs> uh, you have to believe in, in the common humanity. Um, secondly, um, there's the belief that the other is a fully uh, rational being and able to make um, choices for themselves, right? That they're a thinking or a thoughtful um, human being, a thoughtful person. And the third is the commitment to work alongside and, and act and live alongside these other, um, other individuals. So to me, I see those as just exactly what democracy helps us do because it's, uh, I'm sorry, dialogue helps us do, right? So dialogue is a way to um, put into practice these articles of faith that Dewey, that Dewey names. Um, because we can hold certain beliefs in our mind. Maybe we believe theoretically that all people are human, but very few people really act that way, right? And I, I include myself. I don't treat everybody like a human being all the time as they deserve to be treated. And so coming together um, in dialogue is a way, again, what I've spoken about earlier, um, once we can connect with the other, this allows us to have the the experience, the visceral experience of, of seeing the other as a human being, not just saying, checking off the box and saying, oh yeah, that person looks like a, a human being. They are, but of really deepening that experience. And again, in dialogue, taking seriously what they have to say and working together with them means working through differences, right? There's, you know, um, Dewey uh, esteemed pluralism. And um, I think pluralism again, we d is, is different than unity. So we think of our democracy, we have to take seriously its pluralistic nature. We can't expect that the end of the day, our goal is to make everybody think and behave alike. That's not the goal. So the only way for difference to um, survive and be or survive in a productive way to create a democracy is to have some way to engage the other. And this is, I would argue, is, is fundamentally what dialogue is about. Yeah, I like those three very much. The common humanity that the other is a rational human being and a commitment to working, uh, I don't know if you said together, but, but working alongside. D just say a little more about what, what common humanity means because that could be interpreted uh, a lot of ways. Yeah. <laughs> And um, some people argue that um, that doesn't really get us very far because if you look at instances of ethnic cleansing, for example, people say, I can kill you because you're not human. No problem, right? Because you belong to X group, you're not human. So, but I think, um, again, when we look at a, a community writ large, bringing people together and hearing their stories, allowing them to speak and acknowledging, even simply witnessing, I might use that word witnessing their stories is a step further to acknowledge them as human beings. I mean, I don't think most of us go around thinking of ourselves as human beings. I mean, it's not that we don't, but we don't like, unless we're philosophers, right? We don't go around conception, wake up in the morning like, oh, I'm glad to be human. And what does that mean? Uh, et cetera. So um, I think the, the human experience is um, understanding the other uh, in terms of our own desires, right? What do we all value? Um, uh, relationships, we all value creativity, we all value some degree of freedom, we all value the ability to deliberate and to make choices, uh, to partake of families. Um, you know, I could go on and on, but these experiences that make us who we are, then um, we see the other as someone, in dialogue, we can see the other more easily as someone who also values those. Things. So that the notion of humanity or even human rights, it's not an, it's not, it's no longer a notion or a concept. It becomes an experience. And this is what dialogue brings. So we're not arguing for human rights, right? Dialogue is not an argument that you deserve your human rights and I deserve mine. It's through the telling of our stories, through the listening and reflection on our own, each on our own values, as well as those of another, 
there's this commonality that emerges, which I think is what defines humans. You know, and a deeper level of that, you also address in the book, uh, which I'd never thought of before, that possibly uh, requires a pre-dialogue for very, very marginalized people so that they mm -hmm. can find their own sense of agency. Can you say a little bit about that? I found that very, very, very uh, interesting. Yeah. Um, so I think this, this work is, would be the, the work prior to the dialogue. Uh, it might not necessarily be a dialogue itself. And this is something that, um, you know, essential partners really, really taught me um, that especially where you're going into a extremely polarized situation, uh, you need to do a lot of initial work. You want to go, the facilitators here would go in and interview as many people who are going to be involved as possible to hear what their hopes, fears, worries about the dialogue might be. Also to get a sense of what they might not want to talk about, what do they want to talk about, and that would include the sort of language that could be used. So we all know that certain language of the other side um, can be very triggering, you know, take the abortion, right? Pro-life um, can be a triggering term, right? Or a term rejected by others, pro-choice, anti-life, right? So what we call ourselves on the others really matters. So particularly when there's going to be um, a lot of a division or if there's historically been division, uh, very divisive um, interactions, then there's a lot of uh, pre-dialogic work to do. Um, and I would also say that um, something that I learned from the intergroup um, dialogue at University of Michigan, because they're so focused on um, issues of justice and dialogue, you know, some people ask the question, well, isn't dialogue um, just going to reinforce the types of oppressive structures that already are already at play? And I would say, because of the dynamic nature of the dialogue itself, of course you can never guarantee that any space or institution or process is gonna be completely without oppression or oppressive mm -hmm. power. But if you keep the space open to truly listen, and if you've built some, if you've established some trust, then the more marginalized voices are going to be able to say, wait a second here, I'm not heard. And this would even go into, I would say, um, one important component of this dialogic practice is communication agreements. Now, you could say, well, who sets those? Ideally, they're gonna be formed by the group itself, which is a whole work in itself, right? What, what agreements are we gonna agree to? And those can be revised at any time. So if, 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 again, if there's somebody who's from a more marginalized identity in the dialogue and saying that, you know, these, these um, agreements aren't working for me, you tell me I'm not being civil, well, I'm just expressing my emotion in the way that my culture taught me to, right? So that's a, that's a big one, you know, the term, which is why I did not title my book Civil Dialogue, but Civic Dialogue, because uh, civility itself has a lot of cultural um, undertones. So I would just stress that the, the, the dialogue itself, of course, is dynamic, a back and forth, but the whole process, including the whole uh, setup and structure of it, from before the dialogue to post-dialogue, also is open for listening and reflection and interrogating, right? Is this working for us and why? And is it working for, for whom and why? Yeah. I like I like that a lot. Um, I like the idea of the communication agreement. I, that, I, I've used that some terms, not that term, but use the rules of engagement sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and those seem really important. I want my, my final question that I want to ask you um, is about uh, your move from academic life to be to work for health merit and, and and i did something quite similar i, I was 20 years in an, ac in an academic institution i think for a long time it was the same when you were you were a part of it, lord mm -hmm. um, but what motivated you to leave academia and 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 go to uh, become the program director at health mirror working with marginalized youth what was what was going on that that caused that quite dramatic change <laughs> 
Uh, that's a tough story, as some of my friends on this call will attest. Um, necessity is the mother of invention. Shall we just leave it in that short story? Um, I resigned my uh, full-time tenure uh, position due to a lawsuit, but I, I don't really want to get into that now. Uh. So anyway, um, I, I am truly happy. So I had to sort of reinvent myself, um, partly. But at the same time, it was really interesting because I had previously done all of this um, facilitation work. And at the same time, I was also involved in a, um, a two-year multi-institution grant uh, with Essential Partners as the um, as the, the, the lead um, uh, organization on that to study the effects of dialogue in the classroom to cultivate uh, humility and um, uh, conviction. And so I had a lot of practical pieces in my life and at the same time, this opportunity, I actually co-founded the, the Heath Muir Center for Cultural Engagement. Um, so there was, again, another, it wasn't a necessity, but it was an opportunity that was sort of handed to me and um, also was actually involved in some training with Kettering Foundation, I should also give a shout out to, um, at the same time. So I felt so fortunate that in spite of this um, situation, uh, I had some opportunities um, I had some experience. It was something I was interested in theoretically and very interested in practically. So now here I am, I'm a program um, developer of Heath Muir Center and we do um, really do seek to build um, stronger communities uh, by engaging marginalized voices. And, and I've sort of shifted that emphasis to uh, work specifically with dialogue and deliberation. Um, in communities and, and currently doing some work in my own in my own community here on the North Shore. And can you say a little more about that work with with the, the Heath? Yeah, Heath, yeah. So um, we I was hired in 2018 and um, and initially our um, our mission was really uh, directed at youth, as you mentioned, Nancy. And if you go on our website, that's still up there uh, in the process of, of doing some, uh, of doing a redo of the <laughs> website. Um, because of the, the main donor was um, uh, Professor Emeritus, who taught um, college students. She taught English, but she was also very interested in the arts and had always been admitted. Um, even uh, you know decades ago to issues of diversity and so we wanted to uh, form a center um, that that really recognized her strengths and her interests and so uh, we started with youth and that's a, that, that is still really a big part of it um, but youth and the arts um, I think in Massachusetts somebody told me there are um, 700 nonprofits devoted to youth and the arts so again I've really tried to come in and, and sort of steer it to a niche that um, isn't being covered. And so um, a lot of our work has focused around sort of creative um, dialogue events um, and in order to bring youth. So we, we've done a lot with documentaries and then um, following up that with a facilitated dialogue. So getting away from the, the Q&A, the panel of experts, etc., but using some of the examples of dialogue I've talked about here to help people really go deeper because I believe that um, dialogue can be a way not just to help people connect to uh, one another but also to the issues. And so um, we are looking right now at doing some um, uh, uh, post-election, I just spoke with a li the librarian yesterday, post-election dialogues um, through living room conversations, which is something that I've been using more and more. Um, it's online and, and actually Essential Partners, I know is um, really instrumental in advising them. This is a really, I like using them because they, there's a website that people can go to and they can see just what they're gonna get. They have a lot of topics, um, tons of, you know, maybe up to a hundred different topics now with a facilitator guide all laid out. So their belief is you don't even have to be a trained facilitator to get some of these dialogues going. But anyway, all that to say, um, I'm really interested. Keith Muir has been really trying to um, think of creative ways to create community capacity for dialogue. Because if we don't have that capacity, things aren't going, going to go well, as we can see. And I, and I think, you know, 
in my own town of Beverly, I've, I think we've, we've seen this a lot as a result of some dialogues. Um, we are able to have some discussions with the police department to head off, I think, more explosive events or issues or discussions later on. And I think dialogue, again, I've, I've seen it be able to create these conditions of trust. Do we, are we friends? No, not necessarily. Do we all agree? Certainly not. But when you've been able to have a space where everyone at least feels listened to, that they've had a chance to speak, then I think the, there will be less likely uh, to be violence that in, ensues. Um, so that's some of the work that I'm doing with Heath Muir. Yeah, I, I, that was really my final question to get into that area. You say very strongly in your last chapter that um, we really need the attitude of dialogue in our culture. That dialogue needs to be almost like a way of life. If we're to have a democratic society, yeah. it needs to be built into the very fabric of our political culture. Mm -hmm. um, so what are some ways to do that? And you've been kind of mentioning them, but what are some ways that you could even mention to those of us on the call? I mean, what are ways that we could be taking what we know about dialogue mm -hmm. and just spreading it mm -hmm. as a cultural attitude? Yeah. Well, I think, again, like just starting small and not thinking that any dialogue is too small. I was just on the phone this morning with a with a activist in our community, and and sometimes, to be honest, I feel um, a little bit um, maybe insecure about putting dialogue forward when there's real change that has to be made. But you know, it was so interesting. She was she said, you know, this is so important the work you're doing, Lauren, and. Um, talking together, even in small groups. I mean, this is, is the, the word habit that Nancy mentioned before, right, is from John Dewey, cultivate the habits of democracy. And I think the dialogue is a habit. Um, folks from Essential Partners often call it a muscle, right? The dialogue muscle that we have to, it doesn't come natural to most of us, at least not to me. Maybe some people are born with bigger muscle, dialogue muscles, but um, it really just, it takes um, a matter of practice. And I think when we think about communities, they're made of people. And so even if it's gathering your immediate neighbors together and showing people a way to talk, that leaves them encouraged, rejuvenated, and in most of the times healed, even when we don't agree on the issues. Yeah. And so I think we shouldn't undervalue the power of dialogue to bring healing to communities because communities, again, are made up of people. And if dialogue can bring healing to certain people, then this is gonna be the basis of this is the basis of our democracy. And so I, I just really would encourage people to not undervalue the, the power of dialogue for, for bringing healing, especially in this time. And that doesn't mean that you don't go out and march in protests, right? Or sign petitions. Those two are not opposed. We need, if you think that things need to change, you need to put your feet on the ground. Um, but talking, the art of conversation is certainly, as we all know, I'm preaching to the choir here, a lost one. And so any steps we can take to help people know how to do that in a very non-threatening way and say, hey, come over and have dinner. Well, not over and have dinner now, but we'll Zoom, Zoom dinner with each other. Yeah. Talk versus laws, basically. I like that. <laughs> Right. So we are at the time when we need to move into uh, a small groups. I'm going to ask uh, 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 Bobby to put us into small groups. And what we'd like you to do in the small groups is really just to think about what Lauren said to, to, to you know, sort of what stood out for you, what, uh, what your, um, you know, your own experiences related to that, and, and, and certainly think about any questions that you might have when we come back for Lauren. But this, it's your time really to uh, exchange with each other and I guess to practice dialogue a, a little bit. Uh, so um, Bobby, will you go ahead and do that? Put us into groups of four and we'll be in there for, for a, about 15 to 20 minutes. I see that Saskia has asked an interesting question about fear and kind of overcoming that. Saskia, do you want to ans ask that question of Lauren? Yes, do you want me, uh, um, 
Is it clear enough in the chat, yes. Lauren? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. I can, I can address that. And I, I think it is absolutely the right question um, to be asking because it's a real experience that, pe that people have. So um, I mentioned Essential Partners, which was formerly the Public Conversations Project that got its start in the 70s in the Boston area, bringing together, that was actually a group of family therapists who wondered if they might utilize some of their skills to um, uh, help um, discourse in the in the public square and so um, they got together this was right after the shooting of an abortion doctor um, and they got together uh, both sides of the the leaders of both sides of the abortion issue um, they met behind closed doors and um, because their commitment was obviously not to try to solve the problem or convince the other side that they were wrong, et cetera, but to um, decrease the violence will stop the violence, right? And, and create a, a more um, hospitable uh, public square. But, but um, all that to say is that, you know, when, when you're gonna be meeting with people that might be particularly fearful, you might not even wanna start with a proper dialogue. So meals are often a great way. Um, I mean, people obviously have to be committed to it, um, but if you sort of approach them and say, look, you know, I under again, this is where the pre-work would, 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 um, would play out. If you approach somebody and said, um, hey, look, I know um, it might be really tough and challenging for you to sit in the same room as so-and-so or these other people, um, would you be willing to consider first just getting together over a meal? Um, I'm also reminded of, there's this tremendous uh, story. It's a book, uh, but also a podcast with the former white nationalist Derek Black. I don't know if some of you've heard this is on On Being. He was, he was the son of a very famous white nationalist and he himself had started up some website on white nationalism. He was at a college and um, a group of Jewish um, uh, students in, started inviting him to Shabbat dinner every, every Friday night. And they never, they didn't start with, why are you a white nationalist? But they just built friendships. And so sometimes, and over the course of this, of this friendship of, of a couple years, right, it's not going to happen quickly, he, he um, eventually renounced his white uh, supremacy, white nationalism, and he's, he's co-authored a book or go, somebody wrote it for him. But it's a, I think that's a, a really powerful tale about that sometimes you just have to start with, again, what is our fundamental connection as, as humans, often over food? Maybe there could just be a question, let's say, if we're talking about um, racism, right? So if you want to do some anti-racism work or there's a racist tension, you might want to ask a question that's not even directly about that, the issue of race, I mean, the experience of racism, but it could be um, a general question about, talk about a time when you felt misunderstood. So this would be a way for everybody to answer, and that might be it, right? So you're not even necessarily, maybe somebody would bring in something to do with race, but they don't have to. Um, you know, I did a dialogue once on um, identity and it was set in a, um, in a, uh, an art gallery that was, um, had, had photographs by a trans artist. And so we thought that we were gonna do sort of a, a, a dialogue around um, sexual orientation, but we opened it up to identity just for anybody and talked about the, the main question was, um, talk about um, how, how one of your most um, strongly held identities came to place. How did it emerge? And some people didn't talk about um, sexual orientation um, at all. So again, I think it's creative about ways if, if people committed there's going to be a way to bring them together um, and I think the a, a facilitator will really be able to sense out when is the time to go a little bit deeper but certainly you have to take the fear seriously because more damage can be done right you don't want to just force people or bring people together without acknowledging that fear so yeah important important question thank you very much very helpful and thank you Kyle as well for answering in the chat <laughs> Um, let me turn to Tom O'Connor and ask him if he'll ask his question. Do 
You're, we can't hear you, Tom. <laughs> Everybody ought to unmute, then, then we don't have to keep telling people. Why don't you all unmute yourself now, and then, then you'll be able to comment or ask whatever. So go ahead, Tom. Yeah, Lauren, you, it, it, we, it, we were stimulated in our group, um, and the question really we focused on was this relationship between feelings and rationality. And so how do you see those two relating to each other? Just because you talk so much about the identity underneath the rationality, but mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the relationship? Right. Um, yeah, thank you. I often tell my students in philosophy class that it's taken um, philosophers about 2,500 years to realize that we have emotions and a body. <laughs> That's not entirely fair to David Hume, who, um, of course, was a big fan of recognizing the importance of the emotions. But by and large, Western philosophy has not been a big fan of emotions. Um, so, I, but I think what current research really shows is that, you know, our brains are wired to operate on a very visceral reactive level because that's what kept us safe and that rationality is much slower. So it comes in afterwards and it's a way to evaluate sort of is that pop up from our visceral experience. So I don't think that um, you can ever completely divorce them. They're not separated. They, they go hand in hand. Um, certainly there's, for purposes of, of talking, we can, we can speak about, um, uh, again, what, hap what occurs maybe before a rational thought. Rational cognition is really the, one of the slowest features of our brain. Um, and again, it's good for coming in to evaluate, but um, and, and to justify and to rationalize, which is why this is another point from Bohm, right, that he, he made um, saying that a lot of times people aren't aware of these strongly held beliefs that they hold or why they hold them, <laughs> but we're very good at rationalizing them. So I'm not sure I really answered your question. I mean, I don't, I don't ultimately see a separation between the two, um, but a lot of practices have pretended that emotion is not So when you, um, you know, come to uh, structure some sort of uh, dialogue or deliberation, then I think you, you always need to, first of all, ask about what is your purpose in bringing people together? Um, and then you can think about the, how uh, reason, rationality, and emotion might operate. But yeah, uh, did that speak to your question? Yes, it did, but it's clearly a um, complicated one, and I, <laughs> I'm not sure, like, like, you, like you said, I'm, I'm not sure um, we have a clear answer for, for ourselves. I mean, I, I don't think we've done the thinking behind that, but it does seem to me a, a huge issue. Yeah, no, I think, I think a lot of psychologists and, and neuroscientists now are, tr are trying to understand that very interaction, right? That's not my field in particular. I don't do that sort of empirical research. Interesting that, again, a lot of contemporary research is sort of showing what people like Buber and Bohm um, and others intuited. You know, they had the sense that rationality was not the be-all end-all that some philosophers thought it was. Um, Can I... Is someone else just from the peanut gallery able to speak? Please do. <laughs> you mentioned uh, Jonathan Haidt's book, Lauren. Mm -hmm. I righteous did, yeah. Mind. His and work, yeah, in general, yeah. In general, and the righteous mind. I mean, mm -hmm. he deals, doesn't he, with feelings and rationality and the, and the conflict. He's a social psychologist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, a lot, I mean, a, a fair amount of my book, parts of my book really rely on his work. Um, some people think that he um, is a little bit um, reductionist, or a little bit simplistic, some of his accounts. So I want to get into the weeds myself because that's not my area of research. But, um, you know, certainly to think that our rationality controls our emotion, which again is a very simplistic way of reading Plato, um, is, is not effective, right? So, um, yeah. But for those who are interested, I think the work of, I mentioned Jonathan Haidt, of Daniel Kahneman, certainly um, there's a lot of, of work being done on that, showing that at point zero time, um, 
we have a visceral reaction and then um, a point in time later, a millisecond later, then our rational cognition kicks in. <clears throat> Lauren, so, uh, um, um, Lloyd Hansen has made a, a nice quote he put in in the chat that says, Einstein said that intellect is a wonderful servant, but we have made it our master. Um, Lloyd, do you want to say something else about that? Or? Well, okay, Lloyd, well. Has, Lloyd has also said uh, something about the social dilemma, so maybe you can combine those two. Social Dilemma is a new documentary that's available on Netflix. It's out within the last month and a friend of mine in Iceland tuned me into it. And it's looking at the incredible power of artificial intelligence shaping what you see when you connect to a, a, a social media. When you Google something based upon your past viewings, you're going to see something different than I'm going to see when I Google the same phrase that you use. As the whole point is, well, is the people who are interviewed in the documentary are the people who created these technologies uh, without adequate skepticism about what they were doing. And they're now looking back at it more at how the technologies are being used. And, you know, the impact of the Russians on our uh, elections in this country and on the Brexit vote and things like that, because of fear, it's so easy to use these algorithms to create uh, more separation and more polarization, that's what's going on. And I would say, one of the perspectives I really appreciate about this question about intellect, about rational thinking, is um, I very much like the research that the Institute of Noetic Sciences does, IONS, and they're looking at non-material phenomena using the scientific method. And, um, and noetics simply means, from the Greek, and it simply means ways of knowing and recognizing that there are many different ways that we know. And typically, we talk about at least four or five. There's the bodily knowing. Our body knows things. There's intuition, which Einstein referred to. He did say intuition is our greatest gift. And he said that all of his great insights came about through intuition. They didn't come out, come out through the rational processes of his mind. Uh, there's, uh, there's emotional knowing. There's spiritual knowing. So uh, there's a whole broad range of ways that we know how we relate to our world, what is going on in our world. And the rational was what the West settled on quite some years ago as the way of knowing. And it's such a very partial way of knowing. And so many of our problems are shaped because of that very small fragmentation of reality that, that rational knowing can access. Can access. So I'm complete for now. <laughs> Any, Linda, do you want to call on someone else? Uh, sure. Um, uh, Cohen, is that how you pronounce your name? Cohen Weber, do you want to talk about um, what you mean by supporting the space for dialogue? And you're on you. There you go. Yeah, hello. Uh, pleased to meet you. My name is uh, Kuhn. I'm from Holland. And uh, well, pleased to meet you, Lauren. I have a question, um, and, and it's more about. Um, how to create an environment or a space or to create conditions where people who are normally um, are really used to get into debate mm -hmm. uh, and are brought up with argumenting, with uh, rationalizing, how can you create conditions where people, well, move to a more dialogue um, space? Yeah, thanks for your question, Kuhn. Um, so this is really important and something I didn't really get a chance to um, talk about, but, um, one uh, point that I make in my book is that the dialogue I'm talking about works best with a facilitator and with a clear structure. So this is the structure that you're asking about. And again, this really comes a lot from reflective structure dialogue of essential partners. Um, so uh, part of the, the, the pre-dialogic work would be, would be to come up with some questions. Also, depending on how much time you have, you might want to come up with the agreements yourself. If you have an hour to talk, you know, dialogue, you're not going to have time to come up with the agreements. Even two hours is tight. So you want to have a facilitator. You want to have some um, questions designed in advance 
that are really um, targeted to your aim? What do you want? What do you want people to get out of this dialogue, right? How far do you, we want to go in terms of um, Saskia's question, for example, previously? Mm -hmm. um, and then you want to uh, have timed go arounds. This is something that we often use. So we would come in and maybe uh, have a, an icebreaker question, and then we would ask our first question, and we would give um, people a minute to, of silent reflection to think about their answer. So really slow things down. So something that was um, mentioned, I think Lloyd's point about um, the reactivity of, of um, virtual and, and social media, right? Dialogue is really trying to slow down that reactive part of ourselves. So if we help people physiologically slow down, they will be less likely to jump into the argument. But anyway, we start with, start with a question, time for reflection, and then we have a timed go around. So we would give people, depending on the question, depending on the time, one to two minutes to answer. And you are using a timer, you're using your phone. So this is a great way to equalize right from the very beginning. No one's going to dominate. People can pass. That's always an important agreement. So nobody's going to be forced to speak, pass or pass for now, right? And with the communication agreements up there, uh, uh, another, another uh, process is for, we would do a couple rounds like this, timed rounds, two or three questions like this, timed go rounds, during which we say, if you have a question about something you hear, please jot it down. We will have time for back and forth later, but these initial go rounds are, we're just gonna allow people to speak in order. So that can sound really confining for some people. And especially I do use this in my class. It's really weird for students, especially the silent <laughs> reflection part. Mm -hmm. But afterwards, people always comment on how helpful that was for them to go deeper and to really listen. So again, the emphasis mm -hmm. is on really slowing down, curtailing that reactivity, listening and going more deeply, both into your own values as well as those of others. And then you have an open time, again, 15 minutes to 30 to 60 minutes of back and forth, where we encourage people to ask questions of curiosity. Um, mm -hmm. um, I often teach, I have to teach my students, you know, how do you convert your statement into a, qu a curious question. This is hard, this is hard work, um, but that's the emphasis. And then again, with that back and forth, we have the communication agreements up there. And so if somebody's talking all the time, we can say, oh, let's you know, just revisit our communication agreements. One of them was, we wanna share airtime. So let me just open it up to see if anybody else wants to share right now. Um, so there's a lot you, know, you can do, the more structure you have, I think um, the more it sort of just gets people into that a mindset of, yeah, okay, now is not the time for me to beat somebody up about their wrongheaded thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And Pablo, had, you had a question. Do you want to ask yours? Unmute yourself. Good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Lauren, you make a very persuasive case for the importance of dialogue and situations of polarization and a case based on, on the importance of emotions as, as the primary drivers of, of our thoughts and rationality. Uh, you know, uh, Nietzsche thinks of human beings as riding on the back of a tiger. Mm -hmm. uh, Hyde speaks of us trying to guide a very powerful elephant. Mm -hmm. The tiger and the elephant are symbols of emotion. But I think that produces a real serious problem because if emotions are sufficiently alienated or alienating, if emotions are drastically dehumanizing the other person, mm -hmm. it would be even more difficult to move the elephant in the direction of commonality as you try to do. It would be even more difficult to have the interest or the motivation to listen to one another because I think you are the most despicable human being. Why would I even want to listen to what you have to say? So right. if emotions are, it seems that you are shifting the problem to the lower level of emotions, mm -hmm. emotion, but not really solving it. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that, that question actually, because one point I wanna make about Buber 
is that he did not, when he was talking about getting away from this sort of um, cognitive approach in, in um, very rational way of interacting with the other, he did not, um, the, the opposite or the antidote to that is not emotions, right? So it's not the either or of we either are purely rational or we're purely emotion, emo, um, run by our emotions. That's very reductionistic. So to talk about the whole human experience, um, we don't want to think about just us privileging emotions. And furthermore, I think one point that I was trying to make is that on our lower level, it's not really um, um, emotions. I, I, I don't think that was my image that I use. I talk about in the lower level, we have our values and we have social identities, which incorporate, incorporate all cognition and emotions, but they're held together by stories. So for me, the driver of change, it's more helpful to think about the driver of change as neither just rationality nor emotions, but as focus on stories, which encompass both, right? So I don't find it helpful to sort of have an either or rationality or emotion. I think you can never fully separate them. I'm not a fan of the sort of the, the driver being the, the rationality or, you know, and the emotions being the elephant or tiger or vice versa. So I think that what, what dialogue tries to um, take seriously is interacting via stories. So it's not just emotions, it's not just rationality, it's taking both seriously. Of course, we don't wanna get a, um, do away with rationality, and, but we don't wanna, um, it, it's, not, it's not so simple. And this is actually where height has been criticized because he talks about something called the dual process theory of cognition. And that in itself is a little bit simplistic because as we know that we, it's not really right and left brain, they're always interacting. And same thing with the dual cognition, it's not simply rationality alone and, and emotion alone. And so things are much more um, integrated than some of these pictures, which are helpful as pictures, but I just wouldn't take them too literally. But for me, I guess I would really want to emphasize that the driver of change is the exchange of stories that gets to our values and our social identities. May, may I ask you a further a follow-up question with that? Or can, can I? Or? Sure, go ahead. Uh, but that I mean, why would I have an interest in your story to begin with? I mean, you begging the question, uh, and even if I were to be willing to listen to your story, uh, how could you prevent me from distorting everything you say according to my own system of values that is so polarized from the one that you start with? So that even though I listen, I, I don't hear anything uh, even though I hear what you say, I don't listen to you at all. Yeah, well, two things. I think people are motivated. Um, people who, let's say, traditionally wouldn't be really interested in talking with the other, when there is a conflict that directly impacts them, they will be interested. So you see this in, in places around the world of, of conflict, right? If, um, you know, my not having talked to you has created deaths of our family members for both of us, then there's, there's a real motivation. So there's nothing theoretical that you can say to somebody if they don't want to dialogue, and some people don't, you can't make them. But I think in, in conflict resolution, that's the motivation for using dialogue. Um, and then secondly, um, whether people can hear, again, the structure of the process is not going to guarantee anything, but it will slow down. And I think there are very few incidents of people listening to somebody else's story and having their generalization or their stereotype about them only enhanced and increased, right? So you might still think that um, you know, the other is stupid or belligerent when you come away from But I think there tends to be, there'll be a little crack in that and to say, well, maybe they're not totally stupid. They're just like mostly stupid, right? Um, so it's, it's, you can go away and do with it what you want to, but this is, an, this is a, a visceral, you know, existential experience when you are truly able to sit down 
and hear somebody else speak in their own voice, very few people, I mean, if they've been willing to come into the dialogue, are going to um, not be affected by that in a positive way. And I think we have time for one more short one. Paul, do you want to talk about uh, curiosity being crucial? I thought that was kind of an interesting question. Well, I thought it was interesting that Lauren brought it up as so crucial, uh, or at least I, I heard it as being crucial. Yeah, I, I think that goes a little bit to uh, Pablo's uh, concern also, that I, I feel like curiosity is such an essential ingredient. And I think the trick for those who are staging such dialogue is to play on the curiosity of the other person sufficient to have them tell their story. You, they may not want to hear yours, but if you're curious enough to hear theirs, there are very few people who aren't eager to tell a little bit about themselves and their story. And if you're curious enough to probe and ask more, and what happened, and why did you, and how come, the, the person who's antagonistic and doesn't want any bit of this debate, which he sees it as, and the you know, a kind of confrontation uh, is going to be lured. And I, so I think curiosity is such an essential ingredient in, in, the, uh, in the process. And it's one of those givens, you, you know, like you're either born with curiosity or not, I feel sometimes. And if you're not born with... Well, <laughs> I'm going to disagree in a minute, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so, I, you know, I think you're, you're pretty much uh, dead in the water. And... Uh, and, and I, you know, I, well, yeah, that's enough. Yeah. So I, I guess I would really disagree that you're either, I mean, I think some people are born more curious than others, certainly. But again, if we think about dialogue as a muscle, curiosity is also part of that. And so dialogue, and this is what I talk about in my, my final chapter about cultivating the civic habits right, that this is actually a civic virtue of openness, but it has to be practiced. And so sometimes dialogues will take the form like I do with my students, but you could also do this in a civic space of say, look, we're gonna have time now for um, curious questions. And there's in fact an, an exercise that essential partners have, which I use all the time called questions of persuasion and this is a way to teach people how to ask curious questions and I would say to people in the, in the dialogue space look even if you aren't like 200% curious now we're gonna do this as an exercise practice asking a curious question your heart might not be in it but you know I don't really care where you are <laughs> it's, I mean, that's not true but so I think that curiosity can be cultivated and if you create the right space it's easier, right? Some places, some spaces make it easier to come out than others, right? Some people were naturally curious with and other people were not. So I wouldn't lose hope. That's encouraging. No, not because I think curiosity is, is almost the magic or it's certainly part of the ingredient of what happens with a successful dialogue that has to be there. So I'm going to now ask uh, us to switch a little bit and talk about the next interview we're going to do. And Tom O'Connor is online with us and he's our next interviewee and it'll be on November 13th. So mark your calendars for that. And Tom, t tell us a little bit about what you're gonna talk about there. Yeah. Hi everybody, hey, Nancy. Well, what I was hoping to do was pick up on the threads and think with you all about some of the things that we've already heard. And from Bill Isaacs, when he said that um, dialogue is a conversation with a center, not sides. I was wondering about if we could add to that, the dialogue is a conversation about the whole, not the parts. So what does it mean to be touching on the whole? Baum had this implicate order. He had a sense of the wholeness. So that's one, one thing that I was hoping to think with you about. The other thing would be dialogue and implementation. So with Harold, we saw a massive implementation project. So he was able to implement dialogue and become a dialogical organization. But most implementation projects that we know fail. I'm sure we've all tried to, you know, promote dialogue in some way and it's gotten some place, but it hasn't really gotten as far as we wanted it to get. So what's this about implementing? How would we take the 
dialogue skills and the dialogue practices and, and just make them more prevalent in society. And to touch on that, I'll be talking about implementation science. So there is a body of science that's looking at this problem of implementation in every field in criminal justice and healthcare and education, they have an implementation gap. So it's even in business, they, they want to do things, but they're, they're not able to achieve them. So what's the, the, the gap and what's the science about implementation say about what it takes to implement successfully? Because they, they, they claim that if you can follow this science of implementation, you can increase the successful rates of implementation from the average of low 20% to up to 80, 90%. So is there something in that that has a relationship to us in, in, in dialogue, how about the implementation? And maybe the third thing, I don't know if we'd have time, but the third thing it would be picking up on today's conversation that I'm hearing is around this notion of identity. What is it to be a, a human person? We, we are the instruments of dialogue. So when we're talking together, it's about our pure desire or this unrestricted desire that we have to ask questions and to know to feel, to seek the good. So maybe something around that, about what it is that uh, drives us in our consciousness, what's that process of, of dialogue as we're engaging in it. That's, thank you so much, Tom. I'm really looking forward to our conversation uh, on the 16th. So put that on your calendars. And Linda, do you want to now uh, sort of uh, help us uh, check out? I will try to do that. Um, somehow we got uh, into speaker view and I'm not sure if is it just me or probably speaker view okay well I'll try to get myself back um, so uh, this is a time we've got about 15 minutes left so um, any sort of checkouts you want to make any kind of reflections anything anything you'd like to share with the group that you'll go, you'll take away from um, uh, Lauren's talk and interview uh, and Linda, I don't know if you can see it, but in the upper right hand corner, you, you have that little square. If you there we go, now I got it. Yeah, I don't have to okay, out of it. thanks. Good. Yeah, okay, well, I'll try to call on you if you just hold your hand up. 30 seconds for a plug, a shout out for uh, an, uh, a friend of mine who has been doing work in respectful conversation, is his term for dialogue. And uh, real quickly, respectfulconversation.com. He, he does a more uh, hands-on, in, intuitive, he's, a, he's brilliant. Mm. Uh, he's not schooled in um, Gadamer and such. He's trained as an engineer, but he's done more, you know, real work with dialogue, with, with uh, results about abortion, about politics. He's got Trump people talking with Biden people. And uh, you can find him on respect respectfulconversation.com. His name is Harold High, H-E-I-E. -E. Thank you. He's brilliant. All right. So other comments, reflections, takeaways, questions? And several people have noted, I may have said it wrong because it's November 13th. Oh, did you? I don't know. Maybe I might have said it both ways. I'm going to check my calendar, but that's right, isn't it, Tom, that it's November 13th? Yes, I think so. Yeah, November 13th on the Friday. It's actually on a Friday the 13th. That's how you can remember it. Ah, 9 to 11 Pacific. Okay. Can I say something? Of course. Yes, off not. Go ahead. Okay. So I wanted to say many things, but I'll just, we don't have much time. But one of the, and I wrote it in, in the, um, in the chat, one factor that is really important, this is because I deal with dialogic being, and that's the difference between having a dialogue and dialogic being, is that there's the, the factor of power. So many people ask, but what if the other is not interested? Exactly. Many people are not interested in anything to do with the other because the other in our society is secondary. The focus in Western monologic individualist societies is the individual. So it distorts the relationship because the other is the eat, the Bulgarian eat. We use them to promote our books, our, our work, our everything. 
So in order to switch to a more equal, dignity-based relationships, we have to change our perception. We have to start valuing the other to expand the mind um, because the complex uh, dilemmas that we have today are not going to be dealt with the individual. I mean, I can be as genius as I can. I am limited in my own mind. And I need Linda's mind and Lauren's mind and Nancy's mind to expand it to deal with the complexity of today. So what do we do with the power? Because there are people who have power and they don't want to hear us, period. What do we do? This is a big challenge for us. This is one thing. Another thing I wanted to mention is that somebody asked about, um, so how do we change the environment, right? How do we change the environment that is uh, more dialogic? So very complementary to what Lauren said, but more event like Lauren, talk, you talked about the event, but I'm talking generally, we have to transform two things. One is the perception, how we see one another in the relationship, self-other, which has, has to shift in my opinion. And the other is the structure. What kind of spaces, and Lauren talked about that in about the work of essential um, uh, partners, but in general, all the structures that we are operate in needs to be changed in a way that we can include and engage as many people as possible and give them the power, share the power, balance the power. So both of them, perception and structure, complement each other. Thank you, Zofdat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I say just one, one thing about the um, acknowledging the fact that, yeah, I think that's really crucial that pe some people in power um, don't want to come to the table and dialogue is not a panacea. And um, I've been in a lot of personal situations where uh, people in power didn't want to come to the table. And that's where I would say that, um, you know, protest is really important because again, some people will only come to the table if forced. So there's certainly many, many other um, practices in a civic society that can work towards change. And um, so I would just put that out there. Again, dialogue is not anti-protest, which seems like a very anti, it is a, not a dialogical moment, but I don't <laughs> believe that you know, dialogue is gonna solve all of our problems at every single moment in right. life. But if, if we are dialogic, and if we understand the value of the other, then we reduce the need for those, uh, um, um, what did you say, like Black Lives Matter or all those riots. Yes. I mean, it's, it's not going to disappear, but we are different with one another. Yeah, it becomes a way of life. Yeah, exactly. Sharon, Sharon, Sharon has her hand up too. Yeah. You might think of this also as power, but I would call it leadership um, and the, um, the way that one can leverage a position of leadership. So if you look at, um, at uh, Harold Clark at VEDOC, um, which I think mm. most of us know about, or anybody who's in a position of leadership, so beyond your immediate circle, but you're in a position to be able to influence and sort of implement, you know, across a large system, then you say, you're going to do dialogue. That's where you start, right? And of course you educate and you try and bring people on board and all of that kind of stuff, but you can use those positions of positional power um, to uh, move people in a direction that they would not otherwise have wanted to go. Well, love the discussion. I am, so we have only a few minutes, but the implications on leadership, on balancing, about balancing power is so essential. Actually, leadership is shifting, in my opinion, from, you know, the traits that people have, because leadership is relational. If I don't give you, if I don't believe you have power, you have no power. If you don't influence me, you don't have power, right? If I don't change my mind, you don't have power. So it is relational. So it means that leadership is changing is changing. It's not about the leader's traits. It's about what spaces we create to empower as many people as possible. It's creating a different reality, in my opinion. So we have a few more minutes. Um, 
anyone else that would like to um, uh, just uh, uh, reflect or uh, appreciate what Lauren said or uh, any other thoughts before we leave? Sure, I'll just go in the vein of appreciation. Um, Lauren, I want to thank you so much. I think you've tapped on a visceral level, like I can feel it with a resonance in my body as well as the cognitive. I love the way you language it and you make it feel jargon free and really accessible. So thank you on a very, very, very profoundly deep level. Thank you, thank you. I take that as a compliment. As a philosopher, that hasn't always come easy to me, so. <laughs> me, me too, you're utterly winsome. <laughs> June, June Williams. Lauren, I just want to say thank you. Um, you've kind of helped me with a little bit of a struggle that I've been going through. I've been asking those questions and using that curiosity, but you gave me one more to go on about the story. So thank you very much for that. It was very inspiring today. And Sharon Hop uh, Burgess, did you have some? Did you have your hand up? Sharon Burgess, did you have your hand up? No. Anybody else? Yeah. All right. Well, we may be done. This was a wonderful, wonderful interview with you, Lauren. Um, oh, it was so rich, and um, I'm so glad you were able to uh, enlighten us with your ideas and your book. And uh, I just want to thank everyone who showed up. It's not easy to be here for two hours <laughs> on Friday at the end of the week. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, we will look forward to seeing you, some of you maybe at the conference uh, of the Academy happening the last week in October. And if not, we'll see you hopefully November 13th. So, bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you.